Brexit was a messy separation between the UK and the EU. And that animosity seems to be still lingering, especially when it comes to ancient artifacts and who their rightful owners are. If you ask Prime Minister Boris Johnson, the Parthenon marbles, which date back more than 2,400 years, were legally acquired and will remain at the British Museum in London. But that's not sitting well with many across the channel, and if history is a guide, they won't be heading to Greece anytime soon. This photo, taken at the Benin Palace after the raid, shows soldiers with the dismantled plaques that were brought to the British Museum. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for EMCA's The Elgin Slash Parthenon Sculptures Controversy Panel Discussion. This event is in association with the HEPA's Hellenic Cultural Commission. My name is Luke Katsos, uh, EMCA's uh, founder and president, and a HEPA's National Cultural Commission chairman, and I will introduce and moderate the panel discussion. Our distinguished panel today includes Professor Othon Anastasakis, the Director of Southeast European Studies at Oxford, author poet uh, Nicholas Alexiou, Professor of Sociology and the Director of the Hellenic American Project at Queens College, architect, lecturer, artist, John Fotiadis, D.G. Lester, the founder, president of the uh, United States branch of the Hellenic Institute of Cultural Diplomacy, and the former director of education of the Parthenon in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and Professor Sidney Van Nort of uh, the City College of New York, the M.R. Cohen Library Director, Division of Archives and Collections. Before we start the panel discussions, I'd like to introduce uh, D.G. Lester, uh, who will tell us um, uh, what's co coming up in terms of the 125th anniversary of the Parthenon in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. D.G. Lester has a bachelor's degree in history from Belmont University and a master's degree in public history museum studies from Middle Tennessee State University. She is the author of six books and numerous articles. Uh, she was a monthly contributor also to the Nashville Arts Magazine. 
Uh, DG uh, retired in uh, 2018 as the Director of Education for the Parthenon in Nashville and is the founder and president of the U.S. branch of the, of, uh, the 15 Nation Hellenic Institute of Cultural Diplomacy headquartered in Athens. Well, uh, welcome, DG, and uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. Uh, it is an honor to be a part of this program as a distinguished panel brings powerful voice to the ongoing controversy around bringing the, the Parthenon marbles back to Greece. It is also a matter of pride that I have been included in this and that you have allowed both HICD and the people of Nashville to give more public recognition to the fact that this is the 125th anniversary of the Parthenon in Nashville. In 1824, classic scholar and university professor Philip Lindsley arrived in Nashville with a vision to create on the frontier a new Athens dedicated to education and the arts. His Athens of the West over time evolved into the Athens of the South dotted with Greek architecture and also the boast that Nashville had more colleges and schools than any other Southern, Southern city. All of this came to great fruition in 1897. With the, with the Tennessee Centennial Exposition in which the city of Nashville created a full-scale replica of the Parthenon. At the end of the fair, as other things were torn down, the people wanted to keep that building, but by the 1920s, it was in terrible shape. And so uh, architect Russell Hart, based on his own work as in research in Greece and also the 1674 drawings by Jacques Corey, uh, created a new version of the Parthenon, a permanent building made of concrete, which was overlaid with pebbles from the Potomac River to give it a sort of sandy looking color uh, to more match the original. The building has the exact measurements. It has the curvature and the incl inclining of the lines. It has four giant 7.5 bronze doors. We also, in the 1920s, received from uh, the Victorian Albert Museum 14 of the casts from the marbles. Uh, those were used by Bell Kenny Schultz and Leopold Schultz uh, as, as um, to, to create the to create the pediments on each end of the building. The 14 uh, casts were placed inside the Parthenon where they have been since 1931 when it reopened. Um, the, uh, the city of Nashville uh, later on had Alan LaCroix to create the 42 foot statue of Athena as centerpiece of the building. In 2002, uh, the statue was gilded with gold uh, 23.75 karat gold. The city of Nashville is excited about this this year and the, the 125th anniversary. And we are building toward in 2024, the bicentennial of Nashville as the Athens of the South. And I wanted to show you all a lovely poster that has been created for the anniversary. Can you see it? Yep. So uh, we, we again want to thank you all for letting us participate in this wonderful event. And uh, we look forward to uh, advising you all of various events coming on throughout the rest of the, of the year and into 2024. Thank, thank you, D, uh, DG. And, uh, and we want to we also invite you when we bring the, uh, the, the Parthenon, the Acropolis marbles back into Greece so we can have a sister city thing between Nashville and, uh, and Athens. Thank, thank, you again you. For, thank you again for joining us. Now thank we're gonna, you very much. Thank you, thank you. We're, we're gonna start the discussion now with regards to the, uh, to the uh, marbles or sculptures of, of the Acropolis. There has been an ongoing controversy for over 220 years relating to Lord Elgin's removal, starting in 1801 of sculptures from the Parthenon and its surrounding structures, including pieces from the Erechtheum, the Propylaea, 
and the Temple of Athena Nike, all inside the Acropolis. This includes, uh, some of the issues uh, include the legality of their removal from Athens, the reaction during that period, including the strong objection from Lord Byron, who denounced Elgin as a vandal. And we will discuss the background, the acquisition, the hotly contested legality, and the, ra and the rationale of debate for and against the Parthenon Acropolis sculpture's return, as well as issues tra transcending right and wrong, and perhaps areas and research not frequently discussed on the topic. The British government has agreed this past week to talks on the, the repre, uh, repre, uh, repre, well, bringing back the ancient uh, Elgin marbles, which could see the artifacts being brought back to Alas. And the campaigners for the marbles return have shared the delight of this latest update. Still, talking and returning are two different things as the English uh, Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, uh, leading the talks with the Hellenic Republic have said that the UK's longstanding position on the issue has, quote, not changed while the British Museum stated that they would not be taking part in these UNESCO back talks. EMCA does not agree with the Hellenic uh, Prime Minister's proposal in November that the sculptures could be loaned, quote, loaned by the British government to, a, to a, an uh, artifact exchange, but rather EMCA believes they should be, quote, returned, returned. This past weekend, uh, in uh, May 14, 15 edition of the National Herald Magazine was dedicated to the return of the Parthenon Acropolis marbles. And it had excellent articles by various uh, scholars on the topic. In EMCA's full page uh, ad that appeared there, we equated the Acropolis marbles as metaphorical slaves from the Ottoman period, which, were, which have been giving their master's name in other words, Elgin, as all slaves, and boarded on ships over a 10-year period from 1802 to, 1820, uh, to 1812, and that they have been in captivity in London, in a foreign land, enslaved among strangers, and wanting, demanding to be returned to the land of their creation and cultural heritage, alas. Our metaphor related to the Greek slave, Sculpture. If you can, uh, Costa, just bring up that, that uh, image a second. Our metaphor related to the Greek slave sculpture, a very famous sculpture by the American sculptor Hiram Powers. It is one of the best known and critically acclaimed American artworks of the 19th century, which affected the American abolitionist movement and is among the most popular American sculptures ever. Everyone should know that this particular sculpture, by the way, the original, there are four copies of it, but the original is in London. And obviously one of them is in the, uh, in the um, museum that we have in uh, Washington. We, we brought up the uh, Greek slave statue in a couple of EMCA panel discussions relating to the Greek revolution. And as we know, the bicentennial was last year. And uh, we brought it up in our panel discussions relating to its uh, effects on the American abolitionist movement with various scholars, including uh, Professor Alexiou, who's with us today. This is what uh, Hiram said uh, uh, on the sculpture. And this, this sculpture was created in uh, 1844. Quote, the slave has been taken from one of the Greek islands by the Turks in the time of the Greek revolution, the history of which is familiar to all. Her father and mother and perhaps all her kindred have been destroyed by her foes and she alone preserved as a treasure too valuable to be thrown away. She is now among barbarian strangers under the pressure of a full recollection of the calamitous events that have brought her, brought her to her present state and she stands exposed to the gaze of the people she abhors and awaits her fate with, an, with intense uh, anxiety, tempered indeed by the support of her reliance upon the goodness of God. For those who know about the, uh, about the Ottoman occupation of, the, uh, of Greece, 
You all know that for 400 years, uh, the Greeks were slaves within their own nation. We all know that these, uh, these uh, marbles, sculptures, uh, sculptures were taken from the Acropolis during the period of the Turkish occupation. We'll discuss it further in further detail with our, with our panelists today. But again, we, we, EMCA, metaphorically relate to what's happening right now and the statues uh, being, or the sculptures being, sculptures being in uh, London as metaphorical slaves kept in, in captivity by the British government and the, and the London Museum. The return of the uh, Acropolis sculptures will also be one of the themes of this year's Greek Independence Day Parade uh, in New York on Sunday, June the 5th, down Fifth Avenue, and which is the largest Hellenic Independence Day Parade in the world. I'd like to introduce uh, our first uh, panelist, uh, someone we know uh, well, and someone who was also uh, uh, the executive uh, director, actually, uh, one of the executive VPs at EMCA, and that's uh, uh, John Yanifotiadis. John, who we call Yanni Fotiadis, is a modern day Renaissance man whose creative endeavors span architecture, music, and the visual arts. His broader interests uh, uh, referenced in his creative out output include history, philosophy, and metaphysics. John is a licensed architect in the United States for over 25 years and has worked in a profession of architecture for over 30 years. Over the course of his career, he has provided architectural design services to top tier real estate development companies, both nationally and internationally. In addition to projects in New York, John has designed projects in Doha, Seoul, Moscow, Panama, Kiev, Donetsk, Batumi, Athens, Istanbul, and Ankara. John is also known for his uh, many musical talents composing and performing uh, music for film, TV, and podcasts. And additionally, he is an accomplished artist. His recent, uh, his recent work and series of drawings uh, documenting a number of uh, ancient sites in Greece called the Solace of Antiquity has been met with critical acclaim. Uh, John, Yanyi, welcome, and thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you, Lou. As always, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to uh, participate in one of these very uh, stimulating discussions. I was actually really pleased uh, that you contacted me to, to participate in this. Uh, I think that I can certainly offer an architectural perspective. I mean, that's where I come from. That's how I know the Acropolis and the Parthenon intimately. Uh, I think I've been to the, the Acropolis over the course of my life probably 30 or 40 times um, to go and study it and draw and, uh, and contemplate the place. And yes, I, I, this, is a, this is an issue, I think, whose time has finally come. And when I, uh, when I was doing some, uh, some research on the debate and on the different opinions, it seemed that every, um, every advocacy to keep these uh, these art treasures in London just fell uh, kind of very hollow. Uh, they were hollow arguments, um, to me at least. And, you know, we can certainly talk about why that's the case and why, in fact, um, these, uh, these sculptures belong, uh, belong back in their place of origin. I mean, it's really, it's really as simple as that. Thank, thank you, thank you, John, for that. Uh, our, our next presenter, uh, before we start our, our normal pan, panel discussion, will be uh, Nicholas Alexiu, Professor Alexiu. We all know him, obviously. We've uh, we've been together a while, and he's also one of the directors uh, of EMCA. Uh, Professor Alexiu was born in Volos, Greece, where he studied economics. He has received an MA degree, sociology department at uh, CUNY, and a PhD. At the, uh, uh, from CUNY. He has taught in the Department of Sociology at Queens College uh, uh, since uh, 1990 and has received the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching. His fields of interest are social and political sociology, ethnic studies, and research. He, uh, he has established the first archive library museum for Greeks of New York, and he is the Director of Research of the Hellenic American Project at Queens College. Also a contemporary poet, 
He is the author of six books of poetry and many of his poems have been published in Greek and American journals and anthologies. He is a member of the Greek Authors Association in Greece and the American uh, Greek American Writers Guild uh, Association in New York. Well, welcome, Nico, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Lou, for the for organizing this panel. And of course, uh, I'm so happy for our uh, you know distinguished panel today. Uh, I see old friends and uh, uh, meeting new friends uh, today. And this is a very uh, interesting issue. And I'm glad that we bring it back here. Uh, we keep doing that for many, many years, as, as you said, and as Yanni uh, said. Um, I, I, I remember um, uh, a, a year ago when uh, the Greek uh, uh, TV of London interviewed me. And among other things, they asked me, uh, what do I miss from Greece or what is Greek to me? And I said, uh, the light. Uh, that uh, everywhere you go, you see the Greek light. You know, you cannot escape it. Is different than any other place. Even our stones has a lot of light. Uh, and an example is, is our marbles in, uh, and the refusal of the old Albion not to return them. So they want to keep that light. And, and today we talk about that because uh, it goes beyond uh, uh, what is uh, uh, right and wrong, of course. Uh, as, uh, as Yanni said, uh, it, it is very political. It's a, it's a political issue and it has to do with the Anglo-Saxonic uh, mentality, uh, policies of um, uh, uh, cultural imperialism or, 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 or uh, um, colonialism uh, and, and all this. Constantine, uh, uh, let's start seeing some of the panels and, and see some of the, of the points. Of course, uh, at some point, because it's, any, it's beyond any rational uh, discussion, uh, uh, I hope that we, you, 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 with your permission to see some of the, you know, a little bit of the irony uh, besides the uh, sociological political analysis uh, uh, we do here. Uh, so, all right, uh, the basic things, uh, when the Parthenon was built, all this, it's uh, important to, uh, to mention that uh, even Socrates was one of the people who, <laughs> who put some stones there. So uh, it was a way for many, uh, connection with uh, slaves working on the Parthenon and is one of the uh, monuments around the world. And this is one of the uniqueness besides the architectural uh, um, uh, equilibrium and, and, and uh, fantasy and imagination that, that, that has, but also uh, uh, the, the idea of democracy. And uh, as we discussed earlier with Yanni before we start, uh, I understand the issue that uh, uh, the marbles uh, there and around the around the world, as Yanni said earlier, is the history of Athens. Uh, I want to add one more component. It's not only the history of Athens, but it is directly related to the history of democratic processes. Because uh, a structure, a creation like the Parthenon, uh, what makes it uh, unique? It is um, that it was in accordance. It was tied up to to the polis in a political sense um, uh, of, of democracy. And this is uh, uh, one component that we need to keep here in our mind. Uh, of course, uh, in, the, in the next panel, uh, Lou explained um, how uh, Elgin um, uh, was involved. And I don't know, Lou, why you call it um, Elgin slash Parthenon. I want to drop the name Elgin. Uh, no, no, no. It, it, <laughs> anyway. No, no. The, the reason why I called it Elgin, um, and, I, and I put a I put yeah. quote because, let, yes. me, let me explain. Yes. It's quote, because when you have a slave, and you sell yes, them in the market, yes. they typically take the, the, the slave master's name. So when you call yes. him Elgin Marbles, you're saying that he's a slave master. That's why I, I did it on purpose. Very, yes, that's why I wanted to, to stress that. But it is, um, yeah, the Parthenon Marbles. Uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, panel, uh, Costadine, uh, we'll see again some of the arguments and uh, all, all uh, uh, you know, the issues that happened at that time. Uh, of course, uh, he was forced to sell them because he had some personal issues, marital issues, and uh, he was forced to sell them to the British Museum, which of course uh, bought it uh, in a very low price than uh, the one that he, he paid. Uh, in the next panel, Costadine, <clears throat> uh, we know that it's more than half, and not only that, uh, 
last time uh, I was uh, uh, I was uh, uh, in London and visited the, the museum, uh, I realized that uh, the British Museum has about six million uh, visitors per year, and uh, two million of them, which is one third of the visitors, they pay. At that time, it was about uh, ten euros. I don't know how much is now. Uh, to, just to see the 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 Parthenon marble, so it's also an economic uh, uh, resource for, for the museum, since a lot of people uh, pay to see uh, the marbles. Um, in the next panel, we talk about um, some of the issues. Of course, uh, none of the of the uh, Elgin's actions are, were legal. Uh, there is no way that uh, he or uh, people uh, after him try to uh, uh, bring uh, into light the, the, the famous uh, uh, license that he had or the document. It was never produced. Uh, the University of Pitti did uh, uh, an extended study uh, translating uh, Ottoman uh, manuscripts and it was never, never there. So still we don't have this, this famous paper that uh, the basic argument uh, was there. Of course, the other arguments, of course, they, do, they don't mean anything uh, until very recently uh, the British claim that uh, the, uh, Greece uh, has no infrastructure to support or to, to maintain the marble to display them. But this is, of course, uh, ridiculous, especially after the creation uh, of the uh, uh, Acropolis Museum, which for several years in a row uh, is um, uh, voted as the best uh, museum um, uh, in Europe. So none of the claims uh, uh, have any uh, substance or, or rational or, or, or rationality. Uh, so uh, for me today to say a few few things in in, um, in summary uh, from a sociological point of view, uh, it is um, a fickle interest to study uh, the narrative and the ideology that drives this behavior uh, and how you know, try to legitimize it. In the next panel, you see that immediately, as uh, Lou mentioned, uh, if you go yeah, uh, to see, uh, there are many, many uh, criticisms. One approach, what, what, what the stand, the refusal, uh, which is uh, of political, uh, not only cultural and aesthetic, but also a, a political issue, it is the concept of Orientalism. Um, and um, Edward Said, for many years here at, at Columbia, we had many uh, meetings and discussions and his famous book on Orientalism uh, in, in 78, uh, which is uh, the approach to a literary criticism that fundamentally uh, enlightened and changed uh, the, the, the theory uh, related to cultural studies. Orientalism uh, basically is a style of thought uh, based on epistemological distinction made between the Orient uh, or the Occident, right? Uh, Said argues that this is this distinction emphasizes the, the supremacy, the superiority of the of the of the North, of the of the Anglo-Saxonic uh, 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 roots, pe people from uh, with Anglo-Saxonic roots, versus the inferiority of the South or the Orient. In the next panel, we'll see uh more issues regarding orientalism and cultural appropriation uh, that western culture uh, plays defined and redefines itself um, uh, as the other uh, the other is is the east in our case it is uh, the european south uh, we saw it recently again with uh, the economic crisis that Greece went th through and also all the europeans and the supremacy of the northern um, countries um, in that respect, the argument uh, is that this distinction is very important, fundamental, because it requires division other than social uh, con constructs. Uh, in the 1800s, the European artists and thinkers, as we all know, were fascinated with uh, classicism and had begun to uh, um, uh, get the example of Greek antiquity. Uh, they espouse the glory of antiquity so much that they identify uh, with it uh, on a personal uh, level, and not only on a national level, but also on a, on a personal level. Uh, of course, some examples we know uh, a Greek, the hero uh, of, of the revolution, uh, Byron, and the, the role he played, he was fascinated with this. And of course, in his poetry, he was uh, among the first, if not the first, who was so critical um, against uh, uh, Elgin and, of course, uh, supportive of the. Uh, returning uh, the marbles. 
even the uh, the early Virginia Woolf, uh, I'm glad that later she, uh, you know, uh, revisited and she corrected uh, uh, first things. Uh, when I teach um, uh, this course with CUNY students in Greece, in Athens, study abroad, uh, we examine uh, is a course I called um, uh, Greece through the eye through the eyes of travelers and how British and American writers and poets view Greece. So uh, in, as early as 1906, where Greece was free uh, and, uh, up to, to Thessaly, of course, uh, uh, the, the Balkan Wars happened uh, in uh, 1912 and 13, uh, the liberation of Macedonia, Thessaloniki, etc., the northern part of Greece. So Greece was uh, even smaller than uh, uh, it is now. And um, in her diary, of 1906, she wrote somewhere that the people of, of Athens are, of course, no more Athenian is than I am. They do not understand Greek of the age of Pericles when uh, I speak it. So you see that uh, the cultural appropriation of the, uh, this famous uh, writer. So this is the, 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 what is in the mind of, of what is the Western mind. Uh, at the turn of, of the 20th century, it was no longer Socrates, Plato, and Pythagoras inhabiting Athens. Uh, how could Europeans, um, so well schooled uh, in, in the classics, uh, come uh, in terms of that? So we have this uh, uh, unique distinction uh, because when Greece became uh, a new state, maybe Greece is, is, is um, um, an old culture, is an um, uh, ancient people, is, is a very new state. So the new state had to be distinguished from, from, uh, from the, the, the glory of, uh, of antiquity. So uh, Elas is a reference to antiquity and Greece is modern Greece. So the North, even in Tennessee, I, I might say, with your permission uh, to the DG, that, uh, uh, that uh, what we like, it is ancient Greece, uh, we were not very fond of, of modern Greeks. Uh, we saw that also here in the States. At the, at the time that they, they established uh, the, the Athens uh, monument in Tennessee, uh, Greeks uh, used to be the other. But of course, Athens and Athenian uh, and the Parthenon uh, in, 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 in Tennessee was uh, the big thing of Elas, not of modern Greeks who immigrated to the States. So the story continues today, ironically. Of course, uh, the Greeks are not Hellenes, uh, they are Romni. Uh, this is the other, the creation of the other. And uh, the Parthenon at this moment continues to be the most important surviving building of classical Greece. For the British Museum to have the Parthenon marbles rather than return them to Greece uh, is a sign of British superiority, uh, an extension of being the biggest uh, colonizer in history. Going to the next panel. <clears throat> Uh, because uh, I uh, reading and teaching um, certain uh, texts by by Freud uh, in one of my courses, uh, uh, I, I teach uh, his letter that he wrote uh, uh, in 1936, referring to Freud's visit to the Acropolis in 1904. It took him 30 years to come and write, and he calls this amazing title, which is very uh, enigmatic and, and uh, um, intriguing, a disturbance of memory, standing from, um, uh, on top of the Acropolis. Uh, 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 so in history, uh, he said uh, at some point when he went with his brother, when finally one afternoon after our arrival, I stood on the Acropolis and cast my eyes around upon the landscape, a surprising thought suddenly entering my mind. So, so all this really does exist just as we learned in school. And then it was uh, the disturbance of memory uh, goes to the feeling that he had. He remembered his father, that he said, my father will never understand that. And then the son uh, feels the superiority over uh, his father. That was uh, his point uh, later in, in the letter. In the next part, and, I, and I'll use that because uh, uh, I will introduce a new term. I, ha I have a new term um, uh, coming from this uh, Freudian uh, uh, letter. Uh, in 1998, um, uh, a scientist uh, in, uh, in psychology, Susan Sergram, uh, she, she attended an, um, a critical review of, uh, of the letter. 
of, the, of Freud's visit uh, in 1904. And, and uh, he, she talks about uh, the paradox. Uh, and I realized that this is a very uh, um, uh, important issue, but at the same time, uh, is very uh, uh, poorly studied so far. And what I mean for, for that, the paradox uh, is that the radical uh, uh, doubt in, in reference to something one has never doubted before. So uh, this is uh, the point I'm, I'm trying to make here, that uh, in the British mind, it was never a doubt that the, the marbles uh, 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 belong to them and not, and not to Greece. Uh, and we'll see how that comes uh, in terms of colonialism, why, how colonialism and Eurocentricism, especially uh, Northern Eurocentricism, uh, um, uh, supports of all, all that. In the next panel, we'll see some um, um, uh, arguments, uh, which is, I call it the apotheosis of, of British cultural imperialism and colonialism. Um, this is in, in the book uh, that um, Christopher Hitchens wrote, and um, I remember him very fondly. Um, we have invited him uh, twice at Queen's College to talk about uh, the Parthenon Marbles, uh, one in the 90s and one in 2000. He was a keynote speaker in our graduation, and um, uh, he had a book uh, on uh, the, the, the marbles. And um, he includes in this book, he includes uh, uh, the, an interview with Sir David Wilson, who was the keeper of the British Museum. Uh, and this is the apotheosis of, of uh, uh, irrationality. Uh, in, uh, according, according to him, and this is verbatim in quotes, to rip the Elgin marbles from the wall of the British Museum is a much greater disaster than the threat of blowing up the Parthenon. And then uh, he was uh, stunned. The, the, the reporter was, was really, really stunned. He couldn't understand what he just heard and he wanted to verify. And he, David Laumax, and then he, he asks, uh, you're not seriously suggesting there is a parallel uh, between them? I said, yes, yes, I am. I think it is a cultural fascism uh, to, 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 to ask for the return of the marbles, right? This is the cultural fascism that Greece uh, asks um, you know, for, for, for the return of the marbles. Yes, it, it is a cultural fascism. It's, it is nationalism and it is cultural uh, um, danger. This is uh, the position. How, how, but how we come, there, how we justify that? Um, let's see the next panel, uh, Constantine. Uh, so it has to do with the whole uh, process of cultural development in, in Greece. Uh, Greece is a historical accident in many ways, but in the main themes of the modern Greek cultural system, um, we have to realize that all the themes were imported. The main narrative foundations of the self-perceptions and images of Greeks were laid out in Western Europe as components of a, a broader representation of the specificity and sources of European civilization. This is what uh, 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 all authors and writers uh, wrote in their uh, 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 journals, um, the, tra the travel uh, journals, uh, like, like we saw before. So Greeks are probably the only people in the world who did not have to invent their own history and ancestral traditions on their own. Since the 17th century, European idealization of classical antiquity had emerged as a fundamental ingredient of the newly defined essence of an inherently and diachronically superior European civilization. By glorifying classical antiquity, Europeans, and that is Northern Europeans, were seeking to capture their, um, uh, their, their own self-images in an idealized looking glass. Uh, and in conclusion, our statement is, uh, I remember uh, the, uh, the British uh, Union, uh, uh, the Greek, uh, students, um, the Union of the Greek Students in, in, in London had uh, in the late 90s a huge demonstration, thousands of people were there uh, with uh, banners and sent them back. And I am uh, not now, you have to send them back yesterday because this is the only just radical political practice 
uh, 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 returning the marbles is a political act, is not a cultural uh, issue only. Uh, and at the same time, we need to support the British Museum and the British government to overcome what I call, and this is uh, uh, the new term I, I introduce to sociology, the Freudian paradox. It's not a clinical term. I, uh, it is a soci sociological term. I call it the Freudian paradox. When uh, it is a, uh, when your mind, your, your, your psyche is shattered by the realization that something one has never doubted before. And in that case, they never doubted that the marbles, uh, uh, that the British are, are the, the, the true in, um, um, uh, inheritance of, of classical Greece, uh, that it was always something that uh, it was theirs, but at the same time, uh, it never was. <laughs> and this is my point. And this is, uh, this is how I see it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nico, for that. And uh, one of the things that uh, we haven't discussed is um, the creation, how they were created. In other words, uh, when the Acropolis was rebuilt after, after the Persian invasion and how in the Persian invasion, the last Persian invasion, they burned down. They burned down what all the structures in the Acropolis. And actually the rebuilding of it, which took many years after the last Persian invasion, uh, when they defeated them in the Battle of Platea, and they never and they never returned, it was over many decades. But it had to do also with liberation. And one of the important things was when uh, the modern state of uh, of Greece was created uh, after the uh, multi-year war starting in 1821. That that was also uh, uh, battles for liberation just like the ones with the, uh, during, the Persian, the, during the Persian period. And as we recall, uh, when, when there were in fact attacks uh, in the Acropolis, because at that time the, uh, the Ottoman forces were actually in the Acropolis. And when they started to, uh, to knock down parts of it to take the lead out that was keeping pieces of the structure together, the Greek soldiers in that war wanted to give them bullets so they wouldn't destroy the Parthenon and as, as we and the Parthenon and the structures that were there in the Acropolis. And, and as we also know, the, also, the, so, yeah, the Christians did a lot of drama and also the Christians, not only the religious. Uh, uh, no, no, of course, but we're, we're talking about. We're, we're we're talking, genius, right? Our we're allies. Talking, no, we understand <laughs> that. Well, we can discuss that also. But we're talking now about, about the uh, liberation after 400 years of slavery and how even then it was recognized by, by the soldiers that they did not want the destruction of the yeah. Parthenon and preferred to give the bullets, like I said, to the, to the, to the Ottomans versus them destroying it uh, to use the lead that was holding together uh, parts of it. Uh, with that, I'd like to go to our next panel discussion, uh, uh, panelist, uh, uh, Othon Anastasakis, uh, he is um, the director of South uh, East European Studies at Oxford, and from July, the director of European, um, uh, bear with me, because I got this mixed up. I apologize, but bear with me. Uh, anyway, Othon is the director of uh, Southeast European Studies at Oxford, and from July, the director of European a studies uh, center at the University of Ox Oxford. He is a senior research fellow at St. Anthony's uh, College in Oxford and uh, a visiting professor uh, at the Prague School of Economics and Business. He is the principal investigator of the, dias of the Greek diaspora project at the University of Oxford. He is the author and editor of several books, including more recently, Diaspora Engagement in Times of Severe Economic Crisis, Greece and Beyond, The Greek Military Dictatorship, Revisiting a Troubled Past, The Legacy of Yugoslavia, Politics, Economy and Society, A Balkan Legacies of the Great War, The, uh, the Past is Never Dead, and, uh, and many other works. Thank you, Othon, for coming here today and joining us in this uh, discussion. And for us meeting you, for me meeting you, last week and pulling you into, into this discussion. Thank you for being here. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Lou. It's actually a great pleasure to be in this panel. And um, I had uh, for this panel also to um, uh, brush up a little bit uh, my knowledge on what's been happening. Uh, I am a political scientist. I deal with contemporary issues. So what I can add to this conversation is what's happening 
uh, between uh, uh, the in the relations between the two countries, Britain and um, uh, and uh, Greece, how this issue has been approached from a political perspective, uh, and um, the first thing that um, comes to mind when we think as to how these two different countries view at this point uh, this issue is that uh, from a British perspective uh, is very much a legal and political issue, uh, whereas from a Greek perspective is much more an identity and moral issue. And let me explain what I mean by that. From a British perspective, the acquisition of the marbles was totally legal between the UK and the Ottoman authorities. Uh, and uh, then given to the British Museum to become uh, the owner and uh, that any decision over the marbles actually lies with the trustees of the British Museum. Uh, from then on, uh, the British Museum obviously adopted uh, its own imperial mentality. Uh, Nikos has spoken uh, very nicely about this in that how well they preserved the marbles uh, from the Barbanian Balkan uh, people um, uh, who are far away and uh, peripheralized and how the museum is a cosmopolitan center uh, for everyone to go and see the marbles and also to compare with other, civil, other artifacts from other civilizations that exist in the museum. Um, and uh, by actually, they could go as, they have gone as far as to say that by having ripped up completely the, uh, the marbles and having completely disconnected them and the whole continuity that exists in the story, uh, that actually uh, the uh, world uh, benefits even more because they're in two museums now, in uh, the British Museum, as well as uh, in the uh, Athens Museum. And that's even better for the cosmopolitanism of the British perspective. Now, there is obviously an argument as to what kind of precedent that creates. I mean, it was also in the film that was uh, presented at the beginning in that obviously that opens the Pandora's box in terms of what other claims uh, should the British Museum agree uh, to send them back uh, what other claims are going to come from other countries uh, that believe that they're also moral and um, historical proprietors of their own artifacts. Now, from a politician's perspective, there's also another pattern here in the UK. While politicians are in opposition, they tend to be in favor of the return of the marbles. Once they go close to the government, they change their opinion. Um, in the 1980s, uh, it was quite heroic, actually, from the leader of the Labour Party, Neil Kinnock. He was the first to say, as the leader of the Labour Party, to return the marbles to Greece. But when Tony Blair in 1997 came to power, he actually totally believed the opposite. He opted for the marbles to remain uh, in Britain. And actually, that was in 1997 at the time when uh, there was a, quite a controversy over the issue, when it had emerged then that the museum, uh, the museum had actually damaged the marbles uh, during a very brutal uh, restoration in 1938. And uh, the current uh, prime minister, Boris Johnson, true to his uh, insincere self, he has also made a very big U-turn on the issue. Uh, you probably don't know, or you may remember that uh, as uh, the president of the Oxford Union, he had invited back then, Melina Mercuri. He was a student of uh, classics and he admired ancient Greece. He was very much in favor of the marbles returning to Greece. And actually he had very insulting things to say about the drunken culture of the Brits that were keeping the marbles. He brought also Melina Mercuri to even strengthen his uh, belief that the marbles should go back to Greece. As mayor and as prime minister, uh, he also <clears throat> forgot about all that. And uh, he opted for the depoliticization of the matter by saying that this is an issue for the board of trustees of the British Museum to decide. Many of them actually are appointed by the prime minister himself. Uh, and uh, there is the interesting case of the former conservative uh, minister of culture, Ed Basie, who as a minister 
didn't say anything about the return of the marbles, but many years later, as a former minister, he then remembered uh, that the marbles should return to Greece. Now, from a Greek perspective, the matter is not legal, <clears throat> it is moral, and it is identity-based, and we all remember, those of us of the certain age remember Melina Mercuri, how as a unique um, uh, person and politician as well, she kind of uh, advocated so passionately the return of the marbles as something which was very much part of a, um, the Greek identity. Now in Greece is not a political issue. Uh, politicians do not win elections if they return the marbles. It's very much uh, an identity uh, based uh, question. Now it is interesting, although the Greek government uh, feels and believes that the marbles were actually stolen, uh, the, they never pursued the legal argument. And they have actually opted to use means of uh, uh, cultural diplomacy uh, or uh, to try and use the uh, practice of negotiations in terms of um, uh, loaning and getting other, uh, you know, giving loans and of uh, very important artifacts to the museum, but not actually the legal uh, case. And um, it's, uh, uh, but um, uh, in many ways, uh, the uh, keeping the marbles in the British Museum as part of Greece's identity is very much also a memory of the traumatic experience of the Ottoman Turks uh, uh, and the country that was uh, obviously under the Ottomans and how they uh, made the deal. And that's, you know, remaining as it is, it's always this kind of traumatic reminder in the collective memory uh, of um, the Greeks. But where are we today? Uh, we could claim that uh, Greece has some significant diplomatic and moral advantages. Uh, first of all, the issue of the Parthenon marbles is the best known in the world in terms of uh, uh, cultural heritage uh, disputes. It's been uh, also the, uh, the subject of um, innumerable scholarly and popular publications. So it is very much an issue that commands the attention of the global community. Recently, the UNESCO International Committee for Promoting the Return of Cultural Property um, is also approaching the issue as one between states, not, not between museums. Uh, and uh, in September 2021, UNESCO also issued a resolution urging the UK government to revisit its stance. Uh, it also criticized the conditions um, under which the marbles were held in there. We also learned that there were receptions and parties taking place in that gloomy room where they are actually um, uh, kept. Now, uh, the uh, thing, uh, the third thing that is also something uh, which may be in favor uh, of Greece is that there is increasing activism across Europe uh, clamoring to rectify perceived historical injustices, and the idea of returning the marbles to Athens is very much in the spirit of this re-evaluation of history. We uh, in Oxford also know a thing or two about how you revisit your past. There's been a lot of discussion as to what to do with the statue of Rhodes uh, and other uh, imperial uh, Brits uh, at the time. Um, because of that, the Greek government has um, vowed to win over the hearts and minds of uh, Britons. Um, and uh, that is what the new campaign is about. And uh, there has been a recent uh, YouGov poll, uh, which was released showing that 56% of respondents uh, in the UK were in favor of uh, repatriation. I was actually watching yesterday a, a debate uh, which was conducted by the BBC journalist Zeyna Badawi, where she had, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, created this motion uh, in favor or against them, uh, uh, sending the marbles to Greece. And uh, there, were, there was the audience that was actually asked to vote before. Um, and before there were uh, around 150 people that uh, uh, were not decided 
as to what they were believing. But after the arguments, uh, Stephen Fryer, the actor, was also one of the advocates. After the arguments were heard, all of them actually went in favor. So there is this kind of climate that is building up. It's interesting that the newspaper, The Times, which was traditionally in favor of keeping them in the British Museum, they are also making um, adopting a different approach, saying that one of the arguments that the Greeks didn't have the suitable praise to house the marbles is now um, not um, uh, uh, true anymore uh, because of the uh, very fine Acropolis Museum. Even the Daily Telegraph, which is a newspaper that supports um, uh, Boris Johnson, and uh, he, um, uh, it was always uh, in favor of keeping the marbles, is not very happy with uh, uh, Johnson's actually U-turn on the issue, and they're starting to believe differently. Uh, so times are changing and the world is moving on and cultures are craving their homelands and their identities. And there are museums across Africa and Asia that are improving. Indeed, there are more cosmopolitan cities in the world. Nobody would claim that Athens is not a cosmopolitan city. Um, with uh, you know culture uh, uh, mentality and uh, a very good museums, so there is a kind of a different perspective now in terms of how things are looked. Plus, there are the technological innovations that would provide for technological replications as well of the marbles, which is also something that has been approached and suggested. In sum, one argument that has been put. Uh, by the uh, Prime Minister of Greece when he saw Boris Johnson. Uh, he said that uh, uh, Britain uh, should behave like a global Britain now that the country is out of the European Union and that um, the country the, you know, should do this move of uh, trust and goodwill uh, in order to show that indeed Britain is global. I don't think that global Britain is something that is going to work. Indeed, we don't even know what global Britain is all about. What we are seeing more and more is actually the global influence on Britain to be diminishing after Brexit. But what actually should resonate is that the issue of repatriation of the marbles um, is like Brexit Britain in the sense that uh, the issues of identity during all this Brexit period was something very, very uh, prevalent uh, in the British mind. And as they were talking about taking back control themselves from authoritarian Brussels, I think that is the slogan that should also be turned on its head and actually talk about taking back control of the marbles. And it's not about cultural sovereignism or cultural fascism that Nikos spoke about that has been actually um, allegedly um, said about uh, you know Greece's uh, claims, it's actually about identity issues and about um, the issue of, of sovereignty and about also you know uniting, uh, as we all know, uh, this you know procession of the Panathenaea, which actually doesn't make sense uh, to be in two uh, separate uh, places. One of them actually really really ugly. Uh, so with that, I would like to stop. Uh, hopefully we can take back control of the marbles and uh, I'm looking forward to enjoying the rest of the discussion. Thanks, Lou. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Arthana. And um, you had mentioned the cleaning process and uh, as early as uh, the 1830s, actually 1838, they were talking about cleaning the marbles to bring them back to their whiteness. Not understanding, not understanding that pentelic marble over time uh, develops a different a different hue. So they first started to, to uh, actually clean them and destroy them in, uh, in 1858. And then uh, further, when you mentioned in the 1830s, 1837, and, and uh, I'm sorry, 1937 and 1938. But what we do have is some castings that were done. Um, uh, DG earlier mentioned some of the castings that were done for the, uh, for the Parthenon in, um, in Nashville in Tennessee. But there are also castings here, here in New York. And uh, I'd like to introduce now Professor uh, Sidney uh, Van Noort uh, to discuss actually um, castings that were cast uh, early and actually have some of the finer aspects of the, of the sculptures, even more so than currently exist in, uh, in London. 
Uh, Professor uh, Van Nord is, um, is a native New Yorker. Uh, she grew up on the uh, Upper West Side and has always been aware of the spires of Shepherd Hall, which is, uh, you know, the main building actually at, uh, at City College as a feature on the local horizon. Uh, she has uh, childhood memories of attending classical music concerts at the uh, uh, Lewiston uh, Stadium with her parents. So it became a pleasure uh, to learn more about the history of City College of New York when she became the institution's archivist in, uh, in 2000. Her training uh, in, in historical inquiry began during her collegiate studies at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. And she has uh, pursued graduate studies at Columbia University in, uh, in uh, library service where she earned a Master of Science uh, degree specializing in archival management, library preservation, and security. Her final seminar paper regarding uh, library theft was published three times, uh, more recently in 2017, as an article on the topic uh, in the Encyclopedia of Library and Information Science. She has served as an archivist and special collection librarian at the City College of New York since 2000. And uh, she joined the uh, faculty of City College Libraries, which she has curated and collaborated on 23 exhibitions uh, presented at the uh, City College Library. Uh, she is uh, certified by the Academy of Cer Certified Archivists through 2023. She has received uh, training at the Rare Book uh, School at the University of Virginia. Uh, welcome, Sydney, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, and I am so honored to be on this panel with Mr. Quintini as the distinguished architect my, from my sister college of City University, Professor Alexiou, and uh, of course, the professor from Oxford, and Professor Anastakis. And I hope that I can do a screen share. Let's see, and yes, okay. So the Parthenon marble casts were studied and for drawing class purposes by the art department of the City College of New York for many years. And in the 19th century and into the 20th century, one studied classical sculpture by examining plaster cast copies of the originals in various museums around the world. So uh, for City College to have received this gift in, in I think it was 1853, uh, these plaster casts, was quite an honor. They were originally in one of the classrooms in the Shepherd Hall seen on the cover of my City College of New York book. They were somewhere in one of the upper stories there for the art students. And then later, they were in the Mark Eisner Hall, which I hope you see on the screen here, was the art department building from 1953 until the 1990s, when it moved back to one of the collegiate Gothic buildings the Compton Gothels. Then, let's see, do this. Um, yes. And our collection of the casts have, as we have learned from our other panelists, a much finer sense of the surface detail than the originals because of the cleanings uh, on those two occasions. The second one in 1938, under the direction of the art dealer, Lord Devine, and chronicled in Sharon Waxman's book, Loot, with very abrasive techniques. And here are images from this online exhibit about the Parthenon crew sculptures so that you can examine these images in further detail. And in the 1990s, after they had been removed from the Eisner Hall, they were put into storage and came to light. And the former director of the library, Pamela Gillespie, was able to get funding from the Onassis Foundation to have the plaster cast copies cleaned and restored. And then, there was agreement to display them in the lobby of the Olympic Towers building. And they were there from about 2000 to about 2017 when they were removed and moved to the City University of New York Graduate Center at Fifth Avenue and 34th Street. But we have 
great hopes that they will be coming back to the City College campus in the near future. But as, as I said at present, if you are in New York, you will find them at the Graduate Center. And the link to classical sculpture and City College goes very, it's very strong. I mentioned before my, that I had gone to the Lewiston Stadium, which was in the form of a Hemistade classical stadium where musical performances and commencement ceremonies occurred. And also at those commencement ceremonies, which still to this day at the end, in closing, the graduates swear what's called the Euphibic Oath, where they are swearing loyalty to the polis of New York City as the use of ancient Athens would have sworn fealty, loyalty to their Greek, their polis of the city of Athens. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sydney. And uh, I, I've had discussions about those castings for a while uh, with uh, with uh, city city college's uh, president uh, Vince Boudreau. You know, I sit on his executive um, advisory committee, and we ha we have discussed uh, you know uh, doing something actually when they transfer from the graduate center to uh, to city college, and I'm awaiting that. And also city, city College, many people don't realize they have a tremendous amount of, of art, uh, artworks that are uh, amazing actually, and, and have to be displayed uh, in, in, the, in the proper fashion. So I hope to visit uh, actually the Graduate Center uh, with uh, President uh, Boudreau. Uh, I did have the pleasure for many years, and I think many of us who are in New York had the pleasure of always going into uh, the Olympic Tower uh, uh, and the Onassis Museum nearby, where we would view uh, these these amazing these amazing castings that uh, a su a City University uh, has. So thank you thank you for that. And what I'd like to do, if it's okay with everyone, I'd like to go uh, through the rationale, if we can, and whatever comments anybody has is fine. Uh, the rationale for um, uh, both for remaining in London and for going back to Greece. You know where I stand. I regard, I regard the, um, and where Emka stands, we regard actually as the, as the Acropolis um, uh, sculptures to be, to be enslaved uh, in, uh, in London, waiting to be liberated and free. So let's go through the various uh, rationale, for example. Let's start with London, the, the, the rationale. One of the rationales is that if uh, the uh, Acropolis marbles uh, uh, go back, go back to Athens, that uh, they would empty on, and other artifacts and other artifacts, they would empty most of the world's great museums. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's the case, uh, but let's talk about that. Let's talk specifically. Forget about the world's great museums. Let's talk about specifically the London Museum, because that's who's holding the, uh, the uh, Acropolis marbles. Your thoughts on it would empty out um, works of art, uh, you know, at the British Museum. Nico, Othon, anyone? Yes, uh, I'll come back to the Melina Mercury visit. And um, I think it is also on video somewhere. Uh, when uh, that claim appeared then, she said, uh, do you know many Acropolis? <laughs> so uh, it has to do with the uniqueness of the place. Maybe we live uh, in the age of um, high technology, uh, but still architecturally, uh, we, we are unable to uh, create something uh, similar. So uh, although we are very advanced in many, uh, in many areas, uh, at this time, humanity or, or architects or builders, they cannot reproduce Acropolis. So it is a unique monument. So that uh, separates the Acropolis with all other artifacts uh, uh, and, and make the, the claim very, very weak. So it is a unique monument. You cannot reproduce it. Uh, you can have uh, something like the Acropolis, but you can never have another Acropolis. So it is the uniqueness of uh, the structure um, uh, itself that, that, that makes it uh, also additionally to all other cultural issues uh, unique and it has to be reunited. 
Well, but, but let's talk about the British Museum specifically, because they, they are, as you said before, a, a colonial power that went throughout the world and just took whatever they wanted to take. Okay, so we talk about the Acropolis, the Acropolis marbles or sculptures. But one thing we don't talk about is the, is the sculptures from the Temple of Basi. Okay, the second best preserved uh, temple in, in all of Greece, you know, besides the Asphestion, is the Temple of Vasi in, uh, in uh, Arcadia. And when you go to the British Museum, and no one talks about it, when you go to the British Museum, you see the, uh, the uh, marbles that were taken, you walk around the corner, and what do you see there? The sculptures of the Temple of Vasi that were done by the same architects that, that, uh, that built the Acropolis. So the question, again, Othan, I, I leave it to you because we had this discussion, I think, in New York about, about museums uh, emptying out. But I'm talking specifically now about the London Museum because the, the concept of, of great museums emptying out is just an excuse, in my opinion, because I'm also commenting on what I ask, in my opinion, uh, just to get a whole bunch of museums against the concept of bringing back the marbles. What's your thoughts, Othan, about about the so-called uh, Great Museum of Lo the London Museum and thing else. Um, I think that the, uh, the notion of uh, precedent has some validity uh, because uh, um, if this happens, obviously there are bound to be other requests as well. And, and if this major return is going to happen, I'm sure that you know there will be than uh, other countries that would be requesting um, their artifacts. Now, um, I suppose one needs to um, explain the exceptionalism of the, of the Greek case. Um, that's something in my mind uh, that um, might be uh, as an argument um, in the sense that, uh, you know, I was listening to the uh, yesterday to this discussion that I was saying about, and uh, one of those who were in favor of keeping them said, if we start then giving, uh, you know, they will giving back the Rodin, the Delacroix and everything. That's not exactly the case because, mm -hmm. you know, if you kind of cut a painting of Delacroix in the middle and you have it in one, you know, museum, half of it, and the other half you have it in another one, it is only natural that you need to bring the two pieces together. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Um, I'm not so sure either that, for instance, you know, the Brits would be particularly uh, giving with their Stonehenge. And then, you know, if another museum uh, came and took, uh, um, you know, a part of Stonehenge, which is a similar thing to them as the Acropolis for Greece. So. In, I, I believe that there needs to be, you know, a, a, a case has to be made on, on, on the uniqueness of this because it's true that the, the way that this is actually um, uh, placed in, in, in the British Museum simply doesn't make sense. It's just all about having those striking pieces, but, you know, to have part of the court torso uh, mm. of, a, of, of a statue and then to have, you know, the, the, the whole possession being completely, and the way that they are also, I mean, that's for me is also really devastating that the whole story is totally absurd in the way that it's placed in the British Museum. So there is an argument in terms of the exceptionalism of the case, I suppose, and the centrality of the uh, Greek civilization uh, for European civilization, you know, in general. Another, uh, and by the way, everyone just unmute and just jump in. Everyone if I, unmute. If and I just... can add a comment to that. Yeah, please. Yeah, jump in. To jump what, in, please. To what uh, Othan said, which I, which I agree with. I think it also begs the question, what is the mission statement of these museums? You know, if you look at the Vatican Museum, the Hermitage, uh, the, the Metropolitan Museum of New York, the London Museum, on the one hand, you could say, well, the, the, the kid with the most toys wins right? That's a very cynical way of looking at it. But another way to look at it is that if these are actually designed to foster scholarly activity and research, one has to ask the question, with the technology that is available today, you could certainly take, you know, laser precision um, castings of these pieces, uh, build them in, in, in 3D, 
I mean, there, there, there are uh, many, many infinite ways of, of um, utilizing these pieces and being able to return them to their proper place, but still maintaining uh, the research uh, and, um, and the scholarly activity that supposedly uh, a lot of these museums foster. So, and I, I agree with Othon uh, a thousand percent because having been to those galleries, they, they're completely outside of their original context. There's no real understanding or no real effort to make an understanding of how these uh, fit in their context. That's one of the reasons I have the diagram behind me. I thought it would make an interesting background, but it also illustrates just how tightly integrated the, the sculptural work of the Parthenon and the architecture are really fused into one thing. So the way they're uh, displayed now, um, uh, it, it's really more of a, a, of a very bad kind of theatrical placement, completely negating or understanding the original context uh, and, and reason uh, for these sculptures to exist in the first place. Very good, uh, thank you. Let me go, let me go to some of the other uh, rationale you know, for remaining in London. Uh, another thing that advocates talk about relating to the British Museum is that they're saying that uh, the British Museum gets about six, six million visitors a year, as opposed to 1.5 million visitors at the Acropolis Museum. And they're saying if they remove the marbles that uh, it would reduce the number of people who have the opportunity to visit the marbles. What do you guys think about uh, that conversation? Um, if I can jump in uh, again, I think at the end of the day, this is really a political decision. I mean, you know, it started as a political matter in the first place. Mm. Uh, obviously, obviously, you know, um, we spoke about how Greece was a victim of its own success because of its own um, ancient past and how Europeans really loved it. But uh, at the end of the day, and that's why UNESCO is very important in this, is that this is a political decision. And uh, the reason I decided to, you know, to focus on the issue of politics in particular is that by, you know, by discussing this as a museum kind of animosity, we are completely downgrading the issue and we are also uh, taking it to a different level. Uh, it has to be decided politically. I mean, uh, that is the level, in my opinion. No, no, we, we, we agree that at the end it may turn out to be political, but, but just to the question of visitors, okay, to John's point earlier is you can, you can do laser, you know, laser reproductions of these things and have people visit the, you know, the British Museum and, and see copies of these things. I mean, for, uh, for a very long time, as we indicated before at uh, City College, art students were using the castings, uh, you know, for, the, for their artwork. So the concept, the concept of uh, UNESCO and all the rest of that, as I indicated earlier, that uh, the British Museum uh, has stated that they will not be part of these UNESCO-backed talks. And I also stated that, uh, that the uh, English Department for uh, Digital Culture, Media and Sport leading the talks with the Hellenic Revolu uh, uh, Republic have said that UK's longstanding position on the issue, quote, has not changed. So these discussions are all good and I agree with you, it has to be political, but I'll continue with, my, with the points of what they're making because we'll all go, always go back obviously that it should be political, but let's have those discussions regardless. Another argument uh, that they're saying uh, Lou, is- can I, can I add something please, to this? Yeah, please, please o add. Yeah. Obvi obviously, uh, you know, the real thing is the best. Yes. Let's not kid ourselves. That, you know, yes. That's the reason we also wanted back to the uh, Parthenon Museum to put them all together. The real thing is unbeatable. Um, the, the, you know, the argument here is that uh, you know, the British Museum, uh, if one wants to be diplomatic as well, has kindly kept them and preserved them uh, for the, you know, for two centuries, for whatever reason. Now it's actually important to show that it really cares for cosmopolitanism truly yeah. and just to return them. I mean, the real yeah. thing is always the, the best. No, no, the real thing is obviously the best. And I'm, and I'm, I'm making these statements just to make them, as you know. Well, just that's so why I also cited what the, you know, the, the museum needs to ask itself, as all museums do, what is their actual mission statement? Yeah if they are taking uh, the right moral position 
they they can keep copies, you know, high precision copies for for scholarly research, academic research, whereas the originals should go back to their country of origin. I mean, it's it's very very simple. And and these other arguments I mentioned at the top of the uh, the presentation, these are these all ring very hollow. You know, I mean, maybe there was a time when Greece didn't have the physical capacity from from museum technology, for lack of a better word, to present these properly, that's certainly not the case. I mean, the Acropolis Museum is on par with, uh, with any major museum in the world right now. Actually, probably more so, even the way it was designed as a piece of architecture in and of itself and how it orients to the Acropolis so that when a visitor goes into that museum, they understand and they see the direct connection and correlation, it's a much more appropriate setting than, you know, an enormous cavernous uh, tomb, <laughs> you, you know, in London. And, and, and I say that with all respect. I understand that the marbles have been preserved. I understand that a lot of people have seen them. Um, I understand all of the, the political issues that were involved. But really, you know, that, that period has finished. At this point, there's no legitimate reason why these should remain in London. I just uh, on any on any political, moral, any argument, I just don't see it. In, in terms of in terms of, preser in terms of preserving them, because they were always making this argument, they also helped destroy them, <coughs> as we indicated earlier. You know, in the uh, in the 1850s and also in the in the 1930s. Yes, uh, yes, uh, Nico. Uh, no. Uh... All the claims are, are irrelevant. This is what I said in my presentation, and it was clear that this is a political praxis, as we all said, uh, ultimately. Uh, John, this is the issue. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter the cultural or the architectural thing. It is a, it is a political issue because as, uh, as uh, uh, the new geopolitical uh, uh, situation is developing, um, uh, Britain goes to uh, uh, further isolationism uh, outside of Europe. And, and in order to keep uh, the, 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 the old glories, they have to keep to, 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 uh, uh, tighter and tighter uh, to, to, to the Hellenic past that they always thought it, it, it was theirs. So mm -hmm. the more Britain becomes uh, isolated, the exceptionalism and the isolation of, 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 of Britain, the more they're going to stick around. It's not the British Museum, it is the British government. Uh, the British Museum is just an, an excuse uh, as a buffer sure. uh, between, between them and the government. And as, as uh, uh, if Greece uh, in the new world order after, um, after the war uh, in Ukraine now, in, in the new uh, uh, geopolitics in, in Europe, the more Greece uh, remains in the periphery, the more Greece remains uh, irrelevant politically in a unified Europe, uh, the less chances they are. So the, uh, the, the, the new form of, of, of the nation state is, is, is still very strong and, and, and nationalism are very strong. So I believe uh, and, uh, at least this generation uh, of British uh, uh, mentalities uh, in, in the government, uh, British politicians would stick harder keeping the marbles. And Greece, if continues being marginalized and, and irrelevant in, in Europe, it would be very difficult uh, to, to get them back. It's a political issue, 100%. No, no, we understand it's political, but I'm going to continue with the arguments because I like I like the arguments, even though you guys are all going to say it's political, it's political, it's political. Let me say this. Another argument, another argument, another, another argument by uh, Professor Mary uh, Merriman, uh, professor of law at Stanford University. Uh, you know, he argued that the quote Elgin marbles have been in England since 1821, and uh, in that time they have become part of the British cultural heritage. What are what are your thoughts about that, guys? Oh, you go, sociologists, tell me your your thoughts about that. The British cultural heritage. Yeah. Yeah, that was exactly my presentation. That you know, uh, it is this as I call it the Freudian syndrome. You know, they always thought they were theirs, and now all of a all, all of a sudden, this this reality for them was shattered, and then it's unbelievable. They cannot accept it, and and as I said, it, it is it's part of of the new uh, perception. Of what is uh, uh, the British state as a state at, at this moment? Uh, uh, with, with Brexit, so it has to it has to be 
you know, is, 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 is going to be uh, more rigid and, and more uh, uh, in, a, in a paradoxical term uh, to stick with, with, with the old glories as much as possible. Uh, so if, if you go beyond, if you go beyond the, the, uh, uh, the Path of the Marbles and see uh, the cultural production in Britain, what is, what is, what do they export at this time? They are the old glories, you know, more queen, more, more uh, down in the abbey, more, more, more of this. So they, they go back uh, uh, to, 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 to more uh, 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 national themes. So, and, and the marbles are the, the ultimate national narrative they have as British uh, colonial power. Let, let me. Can, uh, I, can I, I just? Yeah, please. Can I just? Please. Yeah, yeah, I, I want to. I want to beg to differ a little bit from what uh, Nikos is saying, uh, because uh, you know I, I do understand the the argument of cultural imperialism. That's something that uh, is you know has has been there and has been very visible, uh, you know, in all the statements um, and the way that um, they have been, you know, conducting their um, foreign relations often. But it has to be said that London is a cosmopolitan city. I mean, you know, it, it is a place uh, that um, has a kind of a multicultural uh, um, environment. Um, that's not something that one can really negate. And, uh, the, you know, Britain also has a soft power around the world. I mean, it, it may not be the same type as the Greek soft power, which is about the ancient, um, uh, you know, past, but uh, yeah, there, there is the language, the music, the universities. I mean, you know, you can think of many things. They are actually, in my opinion, the, the, the British government has been harming its kind of soft power to a great degree because there is, it does exist. Um, it's just the matter for me is always the exceptionalism of the Greek case of the marbles. I mean, that is something really so unique that this is where one has to really stand, uh, you know, their foot. You know, we've we've been having these uh, back and forth arguments with regards to the to the marbles for over two hundred over two hundred years, and as as you indicated, uh, Nico, uh, it even appeared in the poetry of uh, Lord Byron, and uh, and uh, it John had to Keats, be, many yeah, many Keats, poets, yeah, Keats, Keats and other things. But what you know, in the nineteenth century, certainly there were all all types of arguments. One of the arguments. Uh, was that, um, quote, no claim to the stones, that, that uh, the Hellenic people had no claim to the stones, the modern Hellenic people had no claim to the stones, because you could see from their physiognomy that they were not <laughs> descended from the men who carved them, end quote. Okay, in other words, the, the concept that uh, they imagined uh, during that period, and that, that lasted a long time, by the way. Uh, I think it's that, still the case for many people. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't want to say that, John. I didn't want to say that because it, it. <laughs> it doesn't sound too good. But the reality, the reality is that was one of the arguments that I'm sure that's a back, uh, you know, backhanded argument that you know that we know from uh, from the Germans, quite frankly, especially our famous uh, professor who thought we were all Slavs. Uh, you know right. that uh, that in fact uh, there's not one drop of uh, Hellenic blood in any Hellene uh, who's in Alas today. Uh, any comments on that, uh, John, besides saying uh, Well, uh, I mean, uh, I, I think the, the two people on either side of me are far more qualified. But what I can say is that, you know, a lot of what all of this boils down to is cultural identity, right? Um, we as Greeks of the diaspora, because I know we have a Greek in Athens and, you know, New York and in other places, you know, we have we have a sense of identity with the with the uh, the past of antiquity, and what I find very interesting is when um, when you have world powers that try to appropriate this type of identity, one has to ask what what is the underlying um, inferiority that you might feel about your own culture that you have to appropriate the identity of another culture, and I mean if you look at the whole. Uh, geopolitical history of the 20th century, any kind of tyrannical power, uh, and actually powers that continue to operate today. You know, one could argue that uh, the, the war in Ukraine uh, is the old Latin West versus the, the Greek East, you know, at least in, in the mind of some of the people that are perpetuating that war. So this, this concept of inheriting the mantle 
of an old culture and and taking on that identity is is really what I think psychologically goes back to the core uh, of this issue. You know, again, I when nobody has talked about what these marbles actually represent, I don't think even you know half the people that are that are posing this argument really understand. Part of them, the metopes, are a mythical history of Athens. And the frieze, the ionic frieze on the inside, is, a, is really a documentation of the actual history of Athens, right? So this is very, very much about the identity of Athens as a polis, as a city-state. Uh, and there is a city-state today called Athens. It's, it's not to say that, you know, you might have Olmec artifacts in certain museums around the world. People don't even know where the Olmec culture was based. So they might have a maybe a stronger argument in maintaining those argue, those artifacts but you've got a, you've got sculptures that speak about a city called Athens and guess what there's a city called Athens today you know so um i i mean i i, I tend to kind of you know cut away you know a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the detritus to get right to the point uh, maybe you know maybe i'm wrong but that that's how i see it i, I just want to add no, I, I just that, what can I just add something here? Sure. Um, because yeah. I've lived in, you know, uh -huh. in, in, I've lived in the UK for many, many years. Uh, and um, the situation is not, you know, black and white. On the one hand, obviously, really? there is this kind of imperialistic cultural appropriation. But on the other hand, I have come across as well, genuinely, you know, people that actually really want to understand, really want to, um, you know, uh, do research. Uh, and uh, that I think is something that is happening as well. I mean, I, I come from a university that has, you know, the number one classics department in the world. Right. And right. there is genuine, genuine, you know, feeling there about how to, and then sometimes, you know, when I listen to the radio and I hear programs, by the way, the programs that I listen in the UK, the depth and the quality of the study of ancient Greece is something that I haven't come across yeah, in superior, Greek right? yes, popular absolutely. media, you know, or state media or whatever. So that's something that I admire and it makes me feel proud because they are taking something from our own past and they're actually giving it, you know, they're taking it at, at another level. So one can find, I suppose, the best and the worst, but, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I have also learned a lot of things regarding my ancient past through you know the british angle yeah and i and i don't disagree with that in fact i i i know that to be a fact as well and in many ways you won't find a bigger anglophile than myself particularly for those reasons i think it's one thing to speak about the world of scholarship and academia and it's another thing to speak about the very cynical and jaded world of politics which is which is usually the world that that creates the kind of debates that we're talking about you know the uh the activities at places like Oxford that have gone on for the last uh, century, uh, you know, are to be commended. I mean, in a way, they've kept that flame alive from antiquity that might have otherwise been extinguished. So I completely uh, agree with you, and I understand that. Well, listen, there's but, no... Uh, there's, uh, as far as concerned the, the, the identity, remember that uh, in my presentation, I said that the Greeks were probably... Uh, the only people in the world that did not uh, have to invent their, their own identity. Uh, it, it, it was imported how the Northern Europeans saw it, right? So, well, yeah, Nico, so one, one thing that I'd like to mention <laughs> is, you know, we had an EMCA discussion a few months back about uh, neoclassical architecture and classicism as an idea that it was in language and how it came about. And I think a large part of that conversation uh, also touched on uh, a factor that whenever we speak about anything Greek, we have to talk about the fact of this 400 year dark age, you know, of the Ottoman yoke that really prevented enlightenment, it prevented an integration of Europe and the development of how Europe developed. And I think, uh, I mean, even the very reason, you know, the, the legal position that these people are taking saying that, well, I, there was a piece of paper that some Ottoman uh, mayor signed that gave me permission to take this away. I mean, that in and of itself is is meaningless in, in the broader context. So I think we, we can't forget that. You know, we can't forget the fact that one of the reasons why Greece has always 
seemed on the one hand paradoxically as the absolute uh, fountainhead of all European culture and on the other hand as this kind of oddball guy in the south that doesn't really behave the way the rest of us do I think is largely due to that 400 year uh, dark age uh, listen, uh, you know, John, in, term, in terms of the so-called uh, piece of paper, no one has been able to find the so-called piece of paper. You know, there was a claim that he I got... I know, uh, but, but Boris Johnson actually no, refers no, to no, it there, as there the was, legal foundation for why no, these no, I, can stay in no, London. I got, no, I got it. Uh, there's been all types of research with regards to, to the so-called firman that the Sultan at the time, you know, uh, gave to, uh, to uh, you know, Lord, uh, you know, to... Uh, to Elgin, you know, that he could take away the marbles, but but the Ottomans had had saved every one of those firmans. Okay, they have excellent, they have excellent uh, archives with regards to the firmans that were given out by the sultans, and no one can find anything relating. But even if relating. they did find it, Lou, would it really mean anything? Would that mean? The, no, the re the reason why it would mean something has to do with the legal case that was discussed before. You know, why hasn't the Greek government mounted a court case? Okay. And that and that uh, that assertion uh, that assertion that they have, you know, talks about they they've claimed okay that they were given permission during the then the Ottoman the Ottoman legal you know Greece's uh, government, and uh, and uh, you know on that basis it's it's legal, and then they're going on the uh, f taking it even further, they're also saying the legal uh, principle of limitation. In other words, in other words, hey. X amount of years, uh, you know, spanned. Uh, you didn't uh, do anything, go to court, etc., and therefore, you know, it's ours. Yeah, statute of limitations. Yeah, yeah statute of limitations uh, type stuff. Uh, Costa, let me ask you a question. Uh, I sent you a, a link. Do you have that video that you can play for a second, Costa? Is Costa listening? I I think he's still on the call. Yeah, give me a second. There he is. Yeah, because I, I want to do a little humor. I, I excuse me. Let's 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 break for a little humor if we can, if it's okay. A little humor, and then we'll continue the discussion. But I, I just sent him a video that I thought was kind of like, you know, just a little you know humor. I thought it was kind of funny actually. Uh, do, uh, do you have a question or not yet? Yeah, give me a minute because I, I just got the email. All right. As as we're giving him a minute, because what I want to do is just uh, have a you know video uh, uh, you know humorous break, uh, which tie which ties into this particular discussion. Uh, um, they also say that um, that that London has current uh, you know, or England has current laws that uh, that would prevent anybody from taking this stuff because they passed some type of you know laws that said uh, you can't do this or that, and that included, by the way. Uh, what happened with the uh, with the plundering that was that took place by the Nazis? You know that uh, that uh, England uh, had. Oh, you got the video? Okay, let's go. A little humor. Anyway, I, I decided to break for a little humor. You know what I'm saying? Um, but but in a sense, uh, when you when you look at some of these statements, that's exactly what they're saying. We have it. too bad. Yes. See you, you know, too bad. So sad. You know, your dad. <laughs> the Freudian paradox, uh, yeah, exactly. And this is it. Yeah. Let's quickly go through the rationale for returning them to Athens. Okay. The. Um, the Hellenic campaign is basically to reunite, to reunite, obviously, the sculptures. They've created the uh, museum. They've created in such a fashion where the missing pieces are actually are actually uh, set aside in terms of the way they set it up, so they can re re bring them back. Okay, re bring them back and actually place them there. Um, and they they believe that. Um, as John were talking about, they're talking about cohesion, uh, history, they're talking about where they belong and, and to allow the, the visitors a uh, better way to appreciate them. Any comments on that, uh, on the Greek position? Uh, well, it's certainly, it was certainly given their, their, their context as, as described you know, in, the, the, in that museum. And, and certainly the, the point about visitors, I mean, if. The visitors will certainly come to the new to the museum to see them there and back at the British Museum. Perhaps they need to 
rediscover and reemphasize their own culture. And um, visitors will go to the British Museum to see the British culture. I, I've got to tell you, the British culture is an excellent culture and, and they have so much, they have so much there because obviously, uh, you know, we talked about Stonehenge, et cetera, earlier, Arthur mentioned that they, they have that, but they also have, you know, the Roman period with all types of things that they've discovered. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful culture, a great culture. And um, I'm in total agreement. John, your thoughts on, uh, on the uh, unity of the whole? Well, I okay. think I, one, one interesting point to bring up, which is not as, as loaded as, uh, as some of the other stuff that I've been speaking about. You know, the interesting thing about these, um, these particular sculptures is that they also straddle a world of fine art as well as archeology. span and the reason I, I bring that up is because when you bring these back to Athens and people have a reason to go to Athens and they're looking at, at the site of the Acropolis as a whole, or they're looking at a classical antiquity through the prism of, uh, of present day Greece, where they can go to Delphi, they can go to Olympia, they see these pieces in their archeological context, as well as the, the contributions they've made to Western culture, civilization, and fine art uh, over the millennia. And having been now to the Acropolis Museum uh, numerous times, uh, I've, I've actually, you know, I was rather cynical about the museum when it first opened, but after having gone again and again and again, and really uh, understanding how it was designed as a building and how it sits on that site, and it really tries to take in a broader culture uh, and a broader context, I think it's really um, a phenomenal museum to see. And uh, I can only imagine, uh, particularly the way the third floor of that museum is designed where you see the band of the frieze and where the metope should go. There's a whole gallery dedicated to that, more or less online and, and within visual uh, connection of the actual Parthenon where the stones came from. Uh, is actually a very, very moving and a very profound experience. I think it's one uh, piece of contemporary architecture that really uh, works very well. And I think that will become a very unique and special experience uh, if those uh, sculptures wind up there uh, for all of the visitors. And, you know, I think another, another point I want to make is that in this, you know, COVID, post-COVID age, where we have more and more meetings like this and where technology is being pushed to its absolute limits, as far as scholarship go, as far as, far as academic research goes, uh, I, I'm sure it's only a matter of time where all of us can download uh, these marbles in, in super high resolution 4K, you know, three-dimensional ability to see. So th the, the idea that they should be physically located in a place uh, out of their origin for me no longer holds any water. You can, you can get a facsimile of, of that piece and actually study it up close. You don't need to go to, to, to another place to see it. Whereas in Athens, where they were sculpted, where they were created, where the, the, the pieces actually document the history of that place, to me, uh, you know, it speaks uh, a lot about why they should be there. And, th and that, John, is one of the one of the points that are also uh, brought up from the uh, from the Greek side. In other words, that uh, they would be near their original historical and cultural environment that would permit uh, their full a full a fuller understanding Absolutely. and interpret and interpretation. What was also indicated, I think, I'm not sure by who. I think it was by by Nico, uh, relating to the light to the light of Athens. Okay, or the light of Greece, basically the way the way things are are viewed with with that particular light versus I hate to say this, and not negative about Britain, but British light, and and also uh, the discussion on on how they're how they're presented within the uh, the British Museum. What's your thought about the light? I don't know who brought it up. Was it Uni you, Nico? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uniqueness of the Greek light. Yeah. Well, I can okay. tell you one thing, one, uh, right, right on that point, now I'm going to put my architect hat on. If you know about uh, the Parthenon and the Pendelic marble it's made of, 
you know that the molecular composition of pendelic marble is such that light will actually penetrate into the marble a few micrometers and then reflect out. And that's why particularly buildings and why the Romans, in fact, mined quite a bit of pendelic marble to build monuments in Rome because of that unique quality of that stone, that it had this um, almost incandescent property in addition to its reflectivity. So that's well, just for that's the a, marble geeks out there. John, John, it's absolutely true. And, and that's why in, uh, in uh, St. Nicholas that they're building, the St. Nicholas uh, Greek Orthodox Church and National Shrine in Lower Manhattan, they're using that property actually of the pentelic marble because it's the same vein as the, uh, as the Acropolis uh, pentelic marble. And they're slicing it very thin and they're backlighting it so, so it creates a glow. It creates a glow because it has one of those unique characteristics. The pentelic marble uh, has one of those unique characteristics which allows you to do that. Another argument that's being used with regards to setting a precedent is on the Hellenic side, they're saying that, that it, it would not set a precedent because in fact, uh, you know, there's a, there's a different universal value relating to the Parthenon itself and the Acropolis. And they do not believe that it's a similar scenario that it would create, uh, you know, all, all the museums losing, losing all, all, all of their objects. I don't, I don't know what, what anyone thinks about that. Any thoughts on that or? or? I think also, you brought up the, the concept that, that, the, uh, that the sculptures are, are, are very different from some of the things that were being discussed with regards to the museums, uh, you know, losing everything. Is that true, yeah. Uh, Yeah, am I yeah, misquoting? Uh, uh, no, no, I did indeed. And uh, that's why I actually uh, uh, said that uh, where I believe there might be, you know, a convincing argument in showing the exceptionalism of the case uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in, in that storytelling, in those fragments that are kind of missing, you know, half of it is there and the other one is here. Um, that I think is something uh, that uh, needs to be told. and. Um, because I'm one of those that uh, really, you know, um, want to think of what needs to be done as well. I believe that, uh, you know, where we are at this stage is we really need to see um, some of um, some bottom up activism, I believe. I mean, this is where, and uh, you know, this is where we need to have some intellectuals. And if we can manage, you know, in the UK to have more and more uh, people actually um, advocating the return, uh, Non-Greeks, it would be even better. Uh, that I think strengthens um, our case as well. I totally agree. But sometimes, sometimes I get the feeling. Sorry, guys, I get the feeling that intellectuals don't don't, don't move the meter. So, sometimes I think the radicals move the meter even more. You know, so in terms of demonstrations and stuff like that. And you're right. If it's a non-Hellenic crowd, it's even better. Uh, quite frankly, if if we can do that. Uh, another argument that's being used by the uh, by the uh, Hellenic side is that the facilities are, you know, that have been created, because that was one of the arguments, where are you going to show these things? And, and they built these facilities and they're better equipped and more state of the art than uh, in terms of technology, et cetera. And they can pr uh, protect and preserve uh, them better than even the, uh, the, the British Museum or the London Museum. What's the thoughts on that? I think that's a good argument. I could be wrong, but I think it's pretty good. I, I think that uh, John spoke very eloquently of that. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. He did say that the, the museum is just a marvel. And yeah, it's not just about the marbles on the, on the gallery up there on the top, but it's also how slowly you kind of you're introduced before you go to this kind of a <laughs> sublime kind of ending. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know, you, you, you are, yeah. that's the thing that it's, it, it is actually, you know, a whole trajectory uh, that you take from the, from, you know, from the uh, stairs at the bottom uh, to going up. That is really a marvel as a museum. Yeah, not, not only that, as you go through the stairs, et cetera, and you see the whole thing, and then you go outside and you see the Acropolis itself, you know, it, it ties into, uh, you know, to another dis uh, discussion, which talks about that, that this is a single work that was done, a single, you know, single works of art, you know, in the Acropolis. And having fragments, I think we discussed that also, having fragments across different locations, uh, it does not really show, show the pieces in their, in their unity, if you will. And, and it was mentioned that not, not, um, 
you know, the, the British Museum, I guess, I don't know, they have like what, 45, 50% maybe of, of some of the stuff. Uh, but also there, the, you know, I think uh, John or somebody mentioned the Vatican. They have a few pieces as do, as do other uh, museums. Am I wrong guys or no? Uh, from what yeah. I've read, uh, I understand that uh, as, uh, regarding this particular group of sculpture, it's not as if they only exist in the British Museum and nowhere else. I mean, they've been scattered through a number of locations, I think predominantly in Europe. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to claim that I'm an expert, though. Okay. The, the other thing that was mentioned... In some museums, uh, they, they return the pieces. I remember a few years ago when um, the Italian prime minister came and he brought back a, a, a small piece. And, uh, so especially the European South is returning a lot of pieces. Um, yeah. Well, the Germans then, and the yeah. British. You know, the, the famous, the famous uh, vase or what have you of, uh, of the uh, death of Sar Sar Sarpedon yeah. was ret uh, returned by the Metropolitan Museum to, to Italy. Okay, where, where, you know, it came from. So that's yeah. certainly the case. And then another argument, this is good. The Hellenes are using the argument also that casts of the marbles are, are just as able to demonstrate the cultural influences that they're trying to, to project, uh, you know. So the cast, like the cast that we talked about at uh, City College, which are phenomenal. And I think, I think everyone in the audience uh, certainly should visit them, uh, is, is a, a, a prime and a great example of how you can actually see these works of art uh, and in, in some ways better, better in better state, in a better state, than the, than the actual ones that are in, um, that are in London. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, Othon mentioned this, it has to do with the, uh, with the uh, British people and the, and the polling. And the, the suggestion is that most people, most of the British people actually are polling to return them back. And Othon, you mentioned that as being, uh, as being something that's uh, significant. And the Hellenic side is also saying the same thing. I think, uh, <laughs> and, you, and you said that when they're not politicians, when they're not politicians, they're all saying return them. And somehow, when, I guess when they become politicians, it becomes part of some type of nationalism thing, I guess, and you won't be elected if you say, uh, send them back. Is that, is that right, Othon? Well, there's been a lot of political posture, and, you know, um, on this issue of, uh, of, of the marbles. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister himself is actually a, a, a very um, a telling um, example. Um, you, you know, you, we just need to keep this. I mean, the things with the marble is that they've gone through periods of uh, higher intensity and then lower intensity. And at the same time, this is not an urgent matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, the current status quo, no matter how much we don't like it, can drag on for, you know, for years and years. Uh, because this this is no normal actually what we're having now uh, we are asking for something exceptional and in order to be able to do that we really really need to you know um, seize the moment uh, keep the you know the, the debate um, uh, keep the debate as, as intense as possible um, and keep on uh, bringing you know more and more advocates um, and by the way, what I mean to say, obviously, we spoke about with the lectures and how sometimes we can be quite skeptical about them. But um, I'm sure that if I ask, you know, the intellectuals of Oxford, who are, you know, all of, the, all of them in classics, whether they would like them to see them return, they would say yes. Of, of course, of course. But, but then Lou, again, uh, that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Lou, we did a lot of events about uh, 1821 and the revolution and all that, and the, the American feelings. And uh, we about the Greek fire and, and, and the Greek fever and all this, how the mass, how the populace supported the Greek. But the, the, the American government never had the courage to recognize the, 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 Greek, the Greek government and the revolution. Uh, Monroe and other. Monroe himself was uh, an interesting case, right? He, 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 on a personal level and private side, he was supportive of this, but then he signed the famous Monroe Doctrine. So uh, this is what I'm saying. Bringing more advocates is, is a good thing, but you, we have to realize that you have to hit where uh, uh, 
policies are, are, are made, the, the circle of, of policies. And they have to, to, to create a new, a new narrative. Here, we keep talking still about cultural hierarchies, and we have to realize that. And, 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 and British, uh, uh, Britain, this more, as I said, uh, uh, more and more outside of Europe, more isolated. I don't believe that London uh, remains a cosmopolitan city. I have many doubts about that. Uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine shows once more that Europe is irrelevant. It is the American factor that, that plays a, 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 a stronger role for, for many, many years now, and we're going to see that uh, a continuity. Uh, at the same time, to make things more, more complex, uh, we left it out. The Helo, Helo, Heleno Christianity uh, imaginary continuity. Uh, this is another narrative. By giving back the mar marbles, and replace them uh, uh, with uh, the, the laser uh, cut made is impossible for the British because it is an issue of authenticity. They are the authentic uh, 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 pogony, um, you know, relatives of, of, uh, of Plato and, and, and Socrates. They can never uh, uh, settle for, for any kind of the best replacement. It is a matter of, of authenticity because this is how they recognize themselves as the pure, uh, true, uh, uh, sole uh, uh, continuity of, of, of antiquity, of Greek antiquity. On the other hand, Greece is in, a, is in itself in an identity crisis because of our uh, 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 geopolitical uh, position. Uh, we are West, we are East. It's a famous phrase, right? Uh, by Karamalis, we belong to the West, but at the same time, we also had influences for, from, from Asia, from, from other areas. I remember uh, this, this poor guy, Bernal, when he published uh, Black Athena. And uh, then uh, in Greece, uh, even here in New York, in America, we burning the book without the reading because the claim was to challenge the Anglo-Saxonic uh, and Northern European uh, uh, um, superiority, white superiority. That was his, uh, the basic argument, not that Socrates was black or Athena uh, was black, but how the Greek culture is an open culture having a diversity of influences for both the East and the West. But the, the, the uh, Eurocentricism of, of, of that time and, 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 the, and, the, uh, and nationalist ideologies led uh, to, to this conflict. And this is where we are again, in the era of rising nationalism and uh, neo-fascist models around Europe, we see what happens in the Balkan Peninsula, right, or Central Europe with uh, Hungary and others, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, uh, they, they're gonna stick to the marbles for one more generation. I hope uh, this is not true, uh, but I, I, I think that uh, because of nationalism, because of isolationism, and because Greece is in, in a tremendous uh, uh, crisis, both financial, economic, but basically social, uh, uh, that will not happen um, very, very, very soon. Well, and there's no, there's no doubt that uh, we've been talking about this for 220 years now. Okay, from the time that uh, they took the marbles. But in terms of your, your example, in terms of the Hellenic Revolution and uh, how, Amer how the American populace were supporting the revolution and how many Congress people were actually uh, ready to have a, a convention to discuss and vote on actually entering the war on the Hellenic side. And then all of a sudden the vote never took place and it disappeared. As we know, as we know that uh, what happened in that particular case that had to do with the economics of the uh, economics of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the trading with the Ottoman Empire, in particular by the Brahmins from uh, from Boston, and in particular they had gotten wealthy and were able to do whatever they had to do because they were dealing in opium. They were buying uh, opium in uh, in Turkey and selling it in China, and that's known. That's, not, that's a known fact that nobody talks about, by the way. That nobody, nobody talks about in the history. All we talk about is how the American politicians, et cetera, supported the Hellenic cause and this and that, but because of the Monroe Doctrine, that they couldn't enter into the war, et cetera, or have anything to do with European affairs, which quite frankly, historically, if you do a real analysis, is a bunch of nonsense. It's all about, yeah, exactly. it's all about, it's all about trade. It's, it was, yeah. in, in that particular time, mostly, mostly opiate. So, the thing, the thing is, the thing is this: it's been going on for 220 years, 
And some of the discussions about legalities and all this other type of stuff, it, you know, goes around and around and around and around. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And I have to be frank with you. I'm not sure if the Hellenic government has itself uh, understands what the issues are as well as some of the diaspora does. Because I think the diaspora is more into this, into those things and a lot of the things that we talk about than the Hellenic government. The fact that, that somebody would, uh, you know, you know, in government, you know, the prime minister would say that they were willing to trade artifacts, et cetera, to have these things to go to Greece. You know, in the diaspora, we can't comprehend this type of thing. We're talking about their return. The only thing that would, that would, would, would make sense to us is if they were, you know, if the artifacts were brought into Greece, in other words, the, the Acropolis marbles were brought, brought into Greece, and then Greece took them, and they seized them, and they said, you know what, they're ours, we took them. You know, just like you did for 220 years, we stole them now. Sorry, come and get them. That's the only thing that would be logical, at least on this side of the Atlantic. <laughs> anyway, we're going to wrap it up. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of humor also uh, and some very serious discussions. I just like, you know, some final words from, uh, from, from everyone, if you can. We'll start with John, some final thoughts, uh, you know, thoughts on the issue or whatever. Um, well, look, first off, I want to uh, thank you again, Lou, for including me in such a stimulating discussion and, uh, and also among such esteemed uh, speakers. It was a pleasure for me to hear uh, what everybody else had to say. Um, you know, my, my perspective on this is, is through a historical and an architectural prism. Um, I think bringing things back together and trying to make them whole uh, helps us understand what they are. When we deal in fragmentary uh, visions, we, we tend to think in a fragmentary way. So for me, uh, uh, on a very uh, profound and personal level, uh, these belong in Athens. They, they belong in their home. They belong in their original context. And, and so the world can really uh, understand and comprehend them for what they are. You know, a part of a very uh, amazing moment in the human story, you know, of incredible uh, insight um, that occurred uh, 2,400 years ago. These are a product of that, and, um, and, and they belong in their rightful place. I mean, I, I, I really don't know what else I can add uh, to that. You added a lot, John. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, Nuka? Uh, oh, definitely, uh, the, 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 the return, as I said, uh, had to be yesterday, uh, not today, not tomorrow. It has to be yesterday, immediately. Uh, but the return uh, is more complex than just uh, uh, shipping some marbles, some stones from one place to another. It has to do with uh, uh, northern uh, uh, Eurocentrism, uh, with uh, uh, hierarchies uh, uh, for, for cultures and the position um, of Greece in the world. It's not a good case. You have to realize the return of the marbles is not an issue for Athens, it's not an issue for Greece. It is a universal issue. Uh, we experience it also here in the States uh, after the uh, uh, the movement of uh, 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 Black Lives Matter, when we saw uh, to uh, reevaluate uh, the various uh, public monuments uh, that existed in the South regarding um, slavery and exploitation. And, and a lot of those marbles came down uh, as um, uh, because uh, it was a moment of self-reflection uh, and um, um, redefining um, uh, American uh, identity and, and, and the position of, of, of the Black community in the States. The same happens in, in various states. Uh, uh, with uh, 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 the Columbus uh, status, which is a, a big debate. So it is a serious issue. Um, uh, the, the marbles goes beyond just the reunification of, 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 of cultural artifacts, but uh, it is also a serious uh, uh, um, discussion within Europe, and it has to do uh, with democracy. It has to do uh, with uh, uh, correcting uh, uh, old uh, injustices. Thank you, Nico, and thank you for being up with us today. Uh, Othan? Um, well, Lou, I would just like to thank you because uh, you, uh, you, know, you organized a, a, a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, maybe we can have uh, the counter argument as well. Uh, uh, in a, in a next discussion, have uh, that kind of exchange as well. 
with uh, people that we don't agree. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I just want to thank you. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's been a marvelous, marvelous discussion. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you for that. And I, I totally agree with regards to having a discussion. If you, have a, if you have the radicals on the other side, I'd love to have this discussion. It's always, it's always nice. It's always nice for people to have dialogue and, and to exchange ideas. I think if, if we're all one-sided, we don't listen to each other, I don't think that solves anything, quite frankly. And, and I'd love to have that type of discussion. If you can put it together, help put it together, I, I, I'd love to do it uh, in the near future if, if we can. Thank you, Arthur, for, for being there. Thank you for coming from Athens. I know you just flew in, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, within hours, I guess. And it's, it's really great uh, to have you with us uh, today. Uh, thank you for sharing um, a lot of very interesting points that you brought up. Uh, Sydney, uh, your thoughts? Yes. Yeah, just again, thank you for including me in this very distinguished group of scholars. And you know, the discussion about, I think we've made the argument that the Greeks can have responsible stewardship of these materials if they are returned to them and there have been irresponsible actions on the part of the British Museum. And City College will try to promote and be responsible stewards of their plaster cast copies and also in terms of scholarship. In our special collections, we have the Corpus Inscriptiorum Grecum and the Corpus Inscriptiorum Latinarum, whereby Greek scholars uh, from Germany had inscribed, copied every single Greek inscription they could find anywhere in the world and wrote commentary and published it. A sort of virtual collection reuniting all of these inscribed words from around the world. So thank you very much. No, no, thank, thank you, Sydney, and, and thank you. Sydney, thank you. Keep in mind, Sydney, that uh, you, you might do, you want to donate uh, one of the artifacts to Queen's College, who has thousands of Greek students, right? So remember that. <laughs> by, by the way, by the way, you should, you should get the Greek students, uh, Nico. We should go to the Graduate yeah. Center. We should have some lectures, et cetera, on the, on the castings. I think yeah. it would be absolutely spectacular. Past, yeah. Oh, you have done I, that. I did that in the past. Yeah, yeah, of course. Sydney, thank you so much, and and uh, and thank uh, I thank also uh, also uh, uh, City College's uh, president uh, Vincent Boudreau uh, for uh, for working with us in this particular panel discussion. It's it's wonderful to have you have you here um, again for the audience. Uh, you know the return of the Acropolis uh, sculptures will also be one of the themes of this year's. Greek Independence Day Parade in New York on Sunday, June the 5th. Uh, the parade will be going down uh, Fifth Avenue. It'll start about 1.30 on uh, Sunday, June 5th. And it is one of the largest uh, you know, Greek Independence Day parades in the world. Obviously, post COVID, it won't be as big as some of the past parades, but still it's gonna be a great parade. Also, the mayor of New York uh, will have, um, we'll have an event on June the, the 2nd uh, regarding the uh, Greek Independence Day Parade and those that, uh, that want to come, they should uh, contact the Stathakion in New York uh, so they can be part of the, part of the uh, celebration uh, regarding uh, Greek independence. For, those, for the audience, uh, there's, uh, all our lectures are obviously and the panel discussions are on uh, YouTube under the EMCA channel. You can just go into YouTube and basically uh, watch, watch them, including this one after we finish. And uh, for those who are interested in our, our events, uh, just log on to uh, embca.com. That's embca.com. And for those who are interested in AHEPA and all the great things that they do, they are the largest, uh, largest uh, uh, organization of Hellenic Americans. That's ahepa.org if you want to go and uh, find out something about AHEPA. Thank you to the panelists. You were absolutely fantastic. We were serious. We also had some humor. I hope everybody enjoyed the humor that we also had. Um, and and uh, we'll see you next time for another great uh, panel discussion. Thank you again. Thank you Thank all. you, Lou. Take Thank care. you, guys. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you, John. Thank you all. Bye-bye.